I was torn between this one and the Mabouche Corset. Mm -hmm. The Mabouche Corset is beautiful and one of those exercises in, in visual elegance and poetry, which are very rare. However, yeah. I, was, I wanted to know about this one because it's oh, a yeah. beautiful title to it. It does. Well, this is, this is called um, I Love You, and it's um, Lisa Fonsegrieve, uh, who would famously become Irving Penn's yep. wife, yeah, yeah, but yeah. Uh, in 19... Uh, 38. She, she, she's modelling for in the in the Paris studio for for Horst, and um, it was her idea. I'm told to. I mean, you know, Horst was quite enthralled to the sort of surrealist aesthetic that, that, yeah. that that's around at the moment, whether yeah. it's in furniture or shop decor or whatever. Yes. Um, the sort of commercial aspects of surrealism, and he wants to make a little surrealist tableau out of this uh, hat story. And mm. I believe, you know, he, he says something to like Lisa. Well, do can you do something? Can you do something with the hands, you know, pop it up there. Just, and yeah. she's new sign language, and this is the international sort of um, uh, oh, sign really? language signal sign for yeah. "I love you." I yeah. think apparently, yes. I mean, it sounds Excellent. an awful lot to put in one hand yeah. gesture, but it, I believe that's that that's the case. Anyway, we love it for that. And this um, print is one of the few that um, exists at the French Vogue archive. I mean, rather like the British Vogue archive, yeah. um, you know, over, uh, because photography is not uh, recognised as something to keep, um, a lot of it gets chucked out, and the French Vogue's archive got chucked out onto the Place de Palais Bourbon in the 80s. Uh, in Saxe to be liberated by um, Karl Lagerfeld, apparently. Oh, really? So I think, that, you know, although British folk like to say we have the biggest and finest repository of um, yeah. fashion photographs in Europe, it yeah. actually, that accolade might go to, to Lagerfeld, depending on how many bean bags he, he, he picked up. <laughs> he it may be evening. apocryphal, so I wouldn't yeah. like to say, but uh, the story, the, the, you know, that's the, what people thought about fashion photography yeah. right up to the 80s, chuck them into the street. Yeah. Um, this is a lucky survivor, and I love what I love about it. It's got everything I like about it. Um, you know, it's, it's pasted onto a backboard. You know, there's yep. no reverence attached to the to the print. You can see the retouchings coming away there. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, printed one minute, okay. filed away somewhere yeah. else. And I love the writing, the studio writing, and um, I'm not convinced that's horse signature at all. It's probably a studio. No, it's hand. probably something right. who did um, it. But I kind of love it. I think it's it's just great. It looks like a relic, you know. Yeah. It's, um, yeah that was what fantastic. we were trying to achieve with the show. But you know, and Horst goes on to have you know a glittering um, career right up until the so late twentieth century. Let's see the set him a little bit if we can. So he comes after Honigan Hune. He is Honigan Hune's protege. So when uh, Honigan Hune storms out of Vogue. The natural successor in the Paris studio is this young guy Horst right. um, uh, from Germany, uh, living in Paris, uh, and, and he basically takes over where Hune left off. And right. you know the aesthetic is the same. You know he yeah. learnt his his lighting techniques from from yeah. the master from from Hune. But there's three of them at the time. There's plat lines. There's yep. Honigan Hune and there's Horst. They yep. all seem very similar. I'm yep. going to call them the gentleman photographers because I yep. would imagine that's probably exactly. how they were. Yep. Maybe less so now from what you tell about Honigan Hune. But um, one imagines that they were incredibly elegant. Yeah, well, very... I think they're absolutely right. No, they are very very elegant. I mean, we've got some photographs of Honigan Hune in our own archive, and he yeah. is completely. I mean, he's he's he's, he's a fashion plate, and yeah. Horst is the same. They're yeah. all good looking and so on. They're all gay photographers. There's an aesthetic there, uh, Platt Lines, Hune and um, Horst. I think Platt Lines never made it really across to Europe. I think he, he was always in Vogue's either right. New York or Hollywood offices. Right. Okay. Um, but you know, they all would have known each other yeah. uh, and, and, and you're right, they share a similar sort of aesthetic. Yeah. I think what Horst does, um, because he is his career was much, much longer than Hune's is. He's yeah. able to refine what um, what Hune was doing. Yeah. And uh, Horst was taking pictures right up into the 1980s. Oh, completely. And you know, it, it, uh, in any documentary on Horst that's ever shown, yeah. they interview Bruce Weber because Bruce was completely influenced by Horst's pictures. Yeah, um, yeah. The lighting as well as the subject matter, yeah. and uh, you know Maplethorpe as well. Yeah. Uh, there's 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 very much uh, you, you can see a progression there. Yeah. Um, and although, if you ever see Horst or read Horst being interviewed, he's very very self-deprecating to the extent that you think this guy doesn't actually care about what he's really? doing. It just sounds so ephemeral. He'd much rather be talking about, you know, Greta Garbo or whatever, whatever, yeah. and the lunch I had with Chanel, and it was funny because um, yeah. talking about photography yeah. was not 
natural to them. Or maybe that's our yeah. sort of gentlemanly reserve, you know, yeah. or maybe they thought photography was not worth talking about, or maybe they didn't want to give any secrets away, or maybe there are no secrets, I don't know. It's, uh, but it's fascinating that um, yeah. so few of these photographers actually were willing to, to talk about their craft, yeah. um, if you like. It's right, because they have a, such a great amount of craft. Yeah, and I saw, well, I, I saw Horst at work. Um, uh, he came over in 1986, and Grace did a sitting with him in one of the big London studios, and yeah. um, she very sweetly allowed me to come and yeah. meet him and talk to him yeah. and, and watch him work. Yeah. And it was fascinating, because, of course, he didn't. He did that thing that I didn't expect yeah. photographers to do. He would stand there mm. and direct it, there was no right. shutter pressing going on oh, by the really? photographer. No, no, he was absolutely, somebody oh, right. else would do all the click yeah. and click, and it was 10 by 8 cameras, or 5 yeah, by yeah. 4 possibly, yeah. uh, lots of changing around. And the assistant, once the lighting, the assistant yeah. would, would depress the shutter yeah. for him. Well, so he was more like a film director, I guess. Well, that's a, the part of the joy of working with, a, uh, it's a very different discipline working with a 10 by 8 camera, which is a sort yeah, of single absolutely. sheet of film at a time, to work with a roll film camera, which is a sort of conversational yeah. linkage. Yeah, 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 yeah. um, and I worked with a 10 by 8 camera for 15 years, yes, no, exclusively. Absolutely. And what it allows you to do is to free yourself from the camera absolutely. as an object. And you, yes, absolutely. I so get you, that. Yeah. I had, I, mean, I did have a shutter release, which I would stand, and the camera would be here. Mm -hmm. and I'd look through the ground glass screen at the back, get a rough look. Like, and then by the time you've worked with the camera for sort of 13, 14, 15 years, you know what it's seeing. Exactly. So then you can free yourself from it, and yeah. you can stand next to your sitter, and you can and click. That. And, much, and that to, yeah. proximity, that um, relationship that you have with your sitter, is so important. And that's yeah. the thing. And I've always found the sort of camera that comes between you and your sitter, rather annoying. Yeah. So I like being able to free Well, even one that. that you look down on, like a... Like a Hasselbad body flex or a body flex. Because I always think there's that distance is, because you're not looking at them eye to eye, if you, if you were with a 35 mil yeah. or something, um, you, th th there's well, that barrier. And I've often wondered whether it was, Deakin was able to get those extraordinary full-framed headshots because he was looking down and not looking at them, and, you know. I think it, it, it's, it's a different way of working, it's a different, different rhythm, working. it's a different way yeah. of speaking. If you've got a 35mm camera, you have that in front of your face. Yeah. So you have an object in front of your face. But there's another eye looking at the sitter, which yeah. could be disconcerting. But I think that the, the relationship you have with the sitter when you're using an 8x10 camera, mm. which is literally, you, you don't, you're not looking through the camera at them, yeah. you're looking at them. Well, that's and exactly what happened with Horst. I, did, he, when I, was, I wasn't there for very long, 20 minutes, but yeah. n not once in those 20 minutes did he look into the camera or whatever, that somebody yeah. else was doing that. Yeah. It's, it's an extraordinary thing to see. Well, also, um, the 10 by 8 camera is a big sort yeah, of no, like, size of a washing machine exactly. on a kind of telegraph pole. <laughs> He's an elderly man who's wanted to do it. But, you know, <laughs> maybe it's because he'd done it for... You know, 50, 60 years, it he was able to, to do it. I mean, but you, fascinating. You, you, you can get the sense that you know what the camera's seeing. Yeah. I'm sure Abaddon had that as well. Yes, completely. Yeah. I, mean, I, yeah. I um, remember hearing that Abaddon said it was like being a conductor. Yes, well, the, so you, you assembled talent. I very orchestra. much got that impression from watching that horse shoot. Yeah. She had Yasmin Le Bon, he had Yasmin Le Bon, Grace, yeah. right. you know, lots of wonderful people that have gone on to do all kinds of wonderful things, and this man directing them all. And it was, it was yeah. rather wonderful. Um, we, we should have a minute on Lisa Fonsegrie's pen. Yes. Or Lisa Fonsegrie, as yep. she was then. Um, again, one of the sort of early models, uh, early yep. sort of, you know, who became a, a model in her own, you know, Absolutely. Well, career out of being a model. Yeah, I think she's the first model ever to appear on the cover of Time magazine. Uh, right. You know, as, and, and, and she's there because I think that the line that's underneath it says, um, does this face sell refrigerators? So they're <laughs> thinking, modelling, you know, yeah. it's a celebrity endorsement. And, yeah. and, and, you know, her name is known, yeah. Lisa Fonsa Grieve. Um, yeah, so she's, although we mentioned Dolores yeah. back in the days of Demea, yeah. um, you know, that career doesn't last. It's, 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 it evaporates right. you know, because, because Dolores marries uh, an English. Uh, aristocrat and lives yeah. happily ever after in, you know, right. Berkshire or somewhere. Um, and that was her passport out. Was that yeah. Whereas Lisa von Scrupen embraces readily being a model. I mean, they always yeah. say she's the first superstar model, and it always sounds a bit cliched, but yeah. I think, in fact, she probably was because yeah. she enjoyed the process. Yeah. Um, and, and she brought so much to it. And brought so much to it. I mean, she was, she, I think she was an actress monkey. She, I think she was a dancer, uh, right. actually, to begin with. So she has that. She knows how to stand and to help. Absolutely. And, to, yeah. and I'm, you know, I've looked at photographs of her and her poise and yeah. her just how she'll twist her body Absolutely. is just incredible. Yeah, it's instinctive, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but you, you, there'll be other models that, 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 that do that, but I think she was the, the first to sort of be universally acknowledged as, 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 yeah. as being a, 
a model and, and, and exulting in it. Um, and of course, a great influence on, on, on her husband-to-be, Penn. I think yeah. those Paris photographs from 1952, um, 1950, I beg your pardon, would have been, you know, he, he couldn't have done it no, for anyone other than, than Lisa, once yeah. agrees. So we, we talk a little bit about um, what a model brings to a photographer, yeah. and it's kind of clear in his case, in her oh, case. Oh, absolutely. Right? She's, she we've hit the right this. one here. She absolutely brings, brings something. Uh, and, you know, there's a book about her. I mean, it's, um, you know, for, you know, models having books about themselves is not necessarily something new today. No. But, uh, she, you know, th th there's a book that came out, I think, in the early 90s, purely of Lisa Fonsegrieve Penn yeah. photographs of her. And that was unusual because, you know, she yeah. wasn't necessarily a name. But yeah. within that book, you have some of the greatest photogra photographs in the, in the, in yeah. the fashion canon, you know, yeah, yeah. By, by Coffin, by Penn, by, especially by Penn, by Durst, by Blumenfeld. Yeah. Uh, but not by Beaton, who she just didn't, they never established a report. Oh, really? So, yeah, you know, no, it's odd. <laughs> anyway, no, she's a very important figure, and I'm, gr I'm really pleased we've got that one in it, actually. Because, I mean, that's literally her bringing something to the picture. Yeah. And that is the horse saying, do something with your hand, and she yeah. does this, and it's. Yeah. Yeah.